it's it's really good to actually do a progress report on, on my study because it helps me to focus on what has been achieved and what's still to go. And that's a lot. It's a, it's a work in progress. And I want to just focus tonight on some of the more interesting and challenging species that I've been working on in this genus. First of all, first of all, Firstly, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands where we are either gathered or scattered as it may be. And for me, working in Mullaney, it's the Cubby Cubby and Jinnabara people. And I want to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. And also to say thank you very much to my supervisors, um, Associate Professor John Burnley and Dr. Theresa Bell. So introducing you now to Marasmus, for some of you, you're very familiar with it, but for others, this is probably a whole new realm. And I first of all want to say that as opposed to what some people might think, Marasmus are not LBMs and they're not boring little, little brown mushrooms as LBM stands for. They're actually a really species rich and diverse kingdom, uh, genus rather, that's particularly common in tropical and subtropical rainforests. So Southeast Queensland and Queensland as a whole are really hot spots for Marasmus. They're saprotrophs, that is they are recyclers. Their role is to decompose leaf litter and turn it back into humus. So they're part of that whole nutrient cycle. The fruit bodies are generally small, often less than 10 millimetres, sometimes even much smaller than that. Occasionally, they're up to about 30 millimetres. That's quite a big one for a marasmus. They may be white, but often they're colourful in oranges and pinks and purples and reds and rich browns. Some of them actually have the capacity to produce rhizomorphs. And you can see there are rhizomorphs here that are trapping dead leaves that fall from the canopy. And there's a number of them have that capacity. Rhizomorphs are melanin coated threads of mycelium, mycelium being the threads that make up the fruit, the um, main body of a fungus. Those threads are used by a number of bird species in making their nests. This is one of our local birds that uses the rhizomorphs, but many, many bird species also use them. So Marasmus' name was first coined by an early mycologist, Elias Fries, who was Swedish, and he named it in 1838. Um, and Marasmus rotula was the very first one that he named. And so that became the type specimen for the whole genus. The fruit bodies are tough, dry, persistent. They've got very little flesh, as you can see there. They don't deliquesce, that is, they just don't turn into an inky mess as they age, they stay dry. And their stems are either horny, like horsehair, or cartilaginous, so that they can snap. And the gills are usually fairly tough, they're fairly subdistant, and um, they have sharp edges. Fries also said that they often have onion like smells, but most of those species have now been separated off into other genera. genera. And Marasmus, in the strict sense, tend not to have any smell at all. So firstly, one of the ones that I've been working on is the horsehair fungus. So I've been trying to untangle the, this species. It's an interesting fungus, and it seems to have caused more confusion than its very diminutive size should warrant. It was first described in Australia 
by the Australian German botanist who founded the National Herbarium of Victoria, Baron Ferdinand von Mueller. He described it in February, remember the month, 1880. He simply said that it resembled horse hair like mycelium that on the trunks of trees, and it was found from Eastern Gippsland to subtropical Eastern Australia, that it seldom fruited, but fruit bodies had been found once by near the Richmond River in Northern New South Wales. And it was this description, that was, that was all it was. There was nothing more. He didn't designate a type, and I'm not even sure whether he ever even saw fruit bodies, but maybe he did. So then, a few months later in June 1880, Caroly Kalchbrenner, who was a Hungarian mycologist, he described the horsehair fungus as having one to two millimeter white to fulvous fruit bodies, so very, very tiny fruit bodies, very sparse and distant gills, and rigid hair-like stems that were up to 10 millimeters long, arising at right angles, from the mycelium, from those rhizomorphs, and they were growing on a couple of lilypilly trees at Rockingham Bay. For those of you who don't know, Rockingham Bay is the area near Cardwell in northern Queensland, but it was a quasi administrative area that was huge, stretched almost from Ingham to Innisfail and inland to the mountains, So, and it also included the islands of Cardwell. So that whole area is, was called Rockingham Bay, and somewhere there a specimen was found. One specimen was sent to the Fungarium in England at Kew, and it was said to be from Rockingham Bay. Unfortunately, <coughs> over time, the fruit bodies have been looked at by mycologists and they've all disappeared. And all that's left now of that specimen is a few hairs and a couple of leaves. So there's not much there. So basically, the main thing from both of these men was that they commented on these little fruit bodies right, arising mostly from the, the rhizomorphs, not from leaf litter, and that um, they tended to be fairly sparse fruiters. So with that in mind, I started to look at the specimens of all the fungi called Merasmus crinosequi in the Australian field guides. And these are some of them. The first one on the left, you can see, has these really long stems and it's fruiting quite prolifically. It's arising from a leaf and it just doesn't fit with the um, concept of crinosequi, and yet that's what it's called. The, the middle one is uh, from the Tasmanian field guide, and it also had longish stems, rather larger fruit bodies, and this darker colour. It actually um, is also arising from the um, leaf litter in acacia forest, black wattle forest. And the one on the right is the illustration that was used um, in South Australia to um, that painting was of a particular specimen that um, when I examined the specimen, I discovered that it actually is not even in the same section as Crinosecli. So there's three there that have been um, misapplied, had the name Crinosecli misapplied. So another place I went looking for records of Merasmus crinosequi is in the Atlas of Living Australia, which is a very interesting and useful place that anybody can look up online and see where collections have been made or records have been made for different species. And the Atlas of Living Australia had um, 762 records up to May, but um, only a fraction of them actually had images with them. And you can see these are from different states. This is southeast Queensland. Um, possibly that is in the Crinosequi group. 
This one, I would think, is that um, tall, what I call tall dimpled buff, and that was from Victoria. This one on the right is almost certainly the same one as the one in Tasmania, that one's from Victoria. This one may well be in the Crinosequi group because they're all arising from rhizomorphs. This beautiful little one from New South Wales is coming off a mossy log and is almost certainly not Rasmus Crinosequi, and yet they are all called that. So this, all this confusion meant that um, I needed to go on a big field trip and I went up to North Queensland, basically going to Rockingham Bay as my first port of call and um, looking for the um, true, what I was thinking was true Crinosequi. We were very fortunate last year in the wet season and we found a lot of Crinosequi with their horse hairs and they were fruiting. And this is what I was looking for. You can see this was about a metre above ground and there were lots of fruit bodies on it. This is quite unusual to have that many fruit bodies, but it was fruiting very well, also capturing leaves and twigs in the tangle of rhizomorphs. You can see how small the fruit bodies are in my hands. And this is one on the right-hand side, enlarged. You can see how it has a very short stem arising from the rhizomorphs. So that's what we found. And I thought I had it all sorted. But then I started to do the DNA. Now, for anybody who isn't used to looking at, at um, phylogenetic trees, that is the DNA trees of um, any species, just think of a family tree. And if you think of a family tree, then you have your siblings, your close, closest relatives, group together, then you go back and you come back to your cousins and your, your grandparents and so on. So the ones that group together are all in the one, what's called a clade. Uh, they are in the same species. If they have a long distance between them, they're clearly separate species. So this shows that one from uh, down south, what I call conical pimple, the little, it has a little conical pimple in the middle of the, um, the, the fruit body. And it's a beautiful group that clusters together, but is a long way away from the rest. Then I come to what I've called the cryptic crinus group, because I thought when I first went up north that all of these were one species. Well, it turns out that DNA tells me they're not. They are actually at least three different species. So there's, first of all, this one, uh, which occurs mostly in the lowland areas and coastal areas of far north Queensland. And it's possibly slightly different in that the stem is paler and the, the gills tend to be slightly more sparse. However, the next two groups, possibly three, but I think that those two will turn out to be just one. Um, these two groups, I haven't yet been able to separate by looking at them or by looking at their microscopy. So we'll look at those in a little bit more detail. First of all, this is the group of the conical pimple group. It's a, a temperate group, a southerly species. I've, been able to identify it from Tasmania, from Victoria, and from South Australia. And um, it occurs in this sort of country, black wattle country, on the leaf litter, often fruiting quite prolifically, a very beautiful and quite distinct species. Then there's the tall dimpled buff, which is really widespread. And again, fruits quite prolifically on, on the ground, on the leaf litter, no rhizomorphs, and it, we found it from as far north as Spiwa, which is just um, inland from Cairns, right down to New South Wales and probably Victoria. Lots of it in southeast Queensland. Then of the cryptic Crinus group, this is the, the one I call 
the tropical lowland species. And you can see here that the stem is, seem to be a paler brown, not the dark blacky color. And there are these um, very sparse gills. We had originally found it around Cow Bay and then Cedar Bay and um, Josephine Falls. And then we found it in the Rockingham Bay area. Remember that's where the original um, Crinosequi was found. And more recently, Matt Barrett has um, done the work on, of the DNA on a specimen from Iron Range, which has just extended our, its distribution by 600 kilometres. So all of these, except the one from Spiwa, are in the lowland areas. And interestingly, the one from Spiwa was found in a bird nest. Did the bird bring it up from the lowlands? or? Does it actually occur more widely? We just haven't yet sampled that. I don't know. But in general, that species appears to be a lowland tropical one. And then the next one is the one I call the Tropical International Group. And it is, so far, we've only found it in the Rockingham Bay area, remember that area, and also um, further north uh, around Melanda, and Spiwa, but we've had a specimen from the Solomon Islands, and that was from um, a cocoa plantation where it was causing horsehair blight. And that's where the tangles of the rhizomorphs actually bind the leaves together and cause um, problems for when they're um, picking the cocoa pods but it also can um, increase the humidity and the moisture and bring about other um, fungal disease as well. So that's where one has been found. And the other one, which you can't see on the screen, is, has actually been found in Thailand. So that is another international um, place for this particular species. Then the Third one of that group is what I call the subtropical, um, I've just said subtropical, subtropical uh, widespread group. And this one, the furthest north we've found that is it's tropical and subtropical, um, is Mount Lewis, which is very far north. And the furthest south is around the Richmond River area which was one of the areas where it was originally described. Also, the Rockingham Bay area is included. Any of the horsehair fungi that we find in Southeast Queensland are probably of that species. We've found it a number of times from um, Dilkusha, where I live, Mary Pencross, Numanbar Valley, Lamington National Park, and as far south as Dorigo, and as far west as the Bunya Mountains. So that's um, where we've got to as, with the um, horsehair fungus. And the conclusions are that there are at least three distinct species. Two of them at the moment are almost impossible to separate from the field. And there's a bit more work I need to do on that to try and see if I can find uh, characters that will separate them in the field. So moving on then to Marasmus elegans or the velvet parachute. And this one I've called a complex because it's proving to be really very complex. Looking at the ALA records, which you can see up on the right hand top side, there are 1815 records of this species. Now that's a lot of, lot of recordings. And so we ought to know it really well. And this is what it looks like. But it appears that it isn't so well known in New South Wales and Queensland. And initially, when I did DNA on it, it seemed that there was New Zealand, Tasmanian, Victorian, and, Western, and South Australian, and just recently one from Western Australia, which all fitted together. And then there were some others which didn't fit and appeared to be a different species. One of the comments, this was first described 
in, in South Australia by John Cleland back in 1937. And one of the comments in the first description was that the stems were smooth. However, when I started to look at some of the Queensland ones, I discovered that the stems were not smooth, but they actually had cells, decorations on the stems. And these appeared to be quite long and uh, smooth and blunt. And I'll show you what they look like in a moment. And I thought, well, maybe that's a way of separating the Queensland ones, which seemed smaller from the southerly ones, which were more robust. However, that, that hasn't worked out quite as, as I'd hoped. So all of these have turned out to have very similar DNA, just looking at one region of the DNA, that's the ITS, the common barcode region that we, we use first off. And you can see they all have multiple gills, which is a little bit unusual for marasmias. They have bicolored stems. And you can see they start this reddish brown at the base and go right up to pale at the top. And they all have a very hairy or strigose base. But that can vary from a yellow to a white to an almost orange color over here. And the stems themselves can be quite robust or the, and not that long, or they can be extremely long and skinny. So what is going on? Are these all the same or are they not all the same really? So when I started to look at the uh, DNA, I found that all of these appear to be the same, a few on long branches, and that may be to do with some variation. It may be to do with a not very good DNA sample for the ITS. But this includes ones from uh, New Zealand, from Victoria, uh, from Adelaide, and from New South Wales, and also from Queensland. So that's this very large group. And then what we can't see at the top of the screen is what I've called the outliers. So I've called it Merasmius elegans and outliers, because there are other things that have a similar look, but are clearly sometimes cousins, sometimes cousins many times removed when you get up to the one that's in green at the top there. So this is what they look like. Here's the one, the green one that's very far removed. And it has more browny colored cap, still a bicolored stem, still has a hairy base and still has multiple gills. Then we have another one, which I had originally thought was a Queensland Marasmius elegans, and yet it fits into a different group. And when I looked at the spores, they were slightly smaller, but it has the orangey cap and the bicolored stems and the hairy base. You can see the hairy base there. Then we get to another lot, which these ones in the purple here, which look even less like, and yet they are slightly closer related, a brown or an ochre colored cap. And although it's not very obvious, it is a bicolored stem and it does have a hairy base and multiple gills. Then we get to this one, which is very interesting because it looks very like the true elegans. And this was one that Wayne found in um, Linda Garrett. The young fruit bodies look incredibly like the true elegans. The older fruit bodies are not unlike. And it has the bicolored stem, the multiple gills, and the hairy base. And yet, you can see it is quite distinct from this other group here. So this is where I started to look at the stems. Now, originally, the um, South Australian description was that they were smooth stems. And that's smooth, it got a bit disfigured, but it is actually just the normal smooth hyphae that uh, form the stem. 
that was okay, but some of the Adelaide material also had these little cystidia. They're the cells on the, on the stem. They're called corlo, corlo meaning stem, corlo cystidia. And they can be short. They can be quite long. They can be very long or they can be intermediate. And I had thought that this would separate the Queensland ones from the southerly ones, but that's not the case because one of the Victorian ones had this stem and they most of them have somewhere between that and that. These ones are interesting because they've captured a whole lot of spores. And you can actually see that on the stem. The stem has like little crystals on it and they're collections of spores caught by the Corlocystidia. So here we are with uh, true Merasmus elegans having this variation, wide variation from totally smooth to very long, blunt, smooth Corlocystidia. However, when we go to the one, and we're starting at the other end of that, that outlier group, we get some really bizarre things on the stems. And this is the one that uh, Wayne found in Linda Garrett, which we were sure was a, a, um, a Marasmius elegans. And yet look at the decorations on these stems. They have the most amazing elongated, these are called broom cells. And broom cells are a bit like a straw broom with long bristles and um, or we call them digits fingers. And they're extremely elongated and extremely long digits. Occasionally, you get some of the smooth, blunt ones, and also these other broom cells with shorter digits. But how variable and bizarre is that? And then the little one with the smaller spores had very different uh, broom cells. Again, very sparse digits and quite odd looking. Um, decorations for the uh, stems. This other species here with the, the brown ones and the long skinny stems had quite extraordinary um, broom cells and these smooth ones with knobs on them. And then we got to this other sp species here, which were almost totally smooth. The, the stem had either no cystidia at all or just these tiniest little knobs. <laughs> and all of those are within that group of elegans and outliers. So my conclusions for the elegans group is that uh, there's just a lot of unresolved issues at the moment and I need to look at some further DNA analyses and look at, looking at different gene regions to try and see if all that variability is actually more than just geographic variations in the one taxon. And I really need to get more specimens from Southeast Queensland. So moving on from elegance, this one is another thing that looks not unlike Marasmus elegance. However, it's what I call a bristle tap and it's called Af trichotis. Trichotis means hairy. And this Af means it has an affinity with, so it's related to, it looks somewhat like the true trichotis, but it is not the true trichotis. This one we have found in North Queensland, and it has been found once in Southeast Queensland. And it has this extraordinarily hairy stem which you can see with the naked eye. And the cap is also covered in fine hairs as well. But these are not the same sort of hairs as the last lot. These ones look like hypodermic needles. They're short, uh, they're, they're sharp and very pointed. And they're called CT or bristles. And they can be trident-like. You can see these ones have got three points, or they can just have a single point. That's on the stem, and that stem was just covered in these hairs. But the cap also has hairs as well. You can see how they look 
not unlike um, the Marasmus elegance, an orangey cap, a bicolored stem starts dark reddish brown and ends up pale, multiple gills, but you can actually see the hairs on that. And when you look at the uh, cap itself under the microscope, you can see that it also has these bristles or sepi, and they're quite long. And this, the broom cells on the cap have very thick walls in the, the, um, the fingers or the digits. So that's Aphtracotus. And the interesting thing about it is that it is a beautiful little group that is clearly separate from the uh, true Trachotis, which was described in Singapore. And the in interesting thing is that one specimen of this very distinct group was found in Indrapilli in 1998 by a very well-known uh, mycologist, Alec Wood. Where did he collect it? He collected it from a suburban lawn in Indrapilli. It has not been collected since. Now, the question is, has it become regionally extinct, locally extinct, because of the way we treat our lawns or, or whatever? Or have we just not bothered to collect things in the, this area? Um, because sometimes they only occur as a single fruit body. Sometimes there's a whole group of them. But that's the challenge that we have now, is to look for and try and see if we can find more in this area. It's 24 years since the last one was collected in southeast Queensland. And that's what I'm looking for now, is to find another one or more. And the last group that I've started to look at are the blood caps, the hematocephalus or bloodheads. Cephalus meaning head and hemato meaning blood. And these are one of the most beautiful of all the marasmias. And they come in all these different color forms, red, wine colored, or, or almost orangey, it's a, a different red, purple, pink, are they the same? But one of the interesting things to me is that there are only, um, Oh, a hundred and, let me see, not many, a hundred, and 134 records in ALA. And that seems extraordinary when you think there's 1800 records of Marasmus elegance, yet there's only 134 records of this beautiful and very distinct looking species. Uh, and mo most of them actually are from southeast Queensland. These ones down in Victoria are from 1887. It's my feeling that it does not actually exist in Victoria. I think it is a subtropical, tropical species. It's meant to be cosmopolitan. It was first described in Brazil back in 1837, but was no type specimen and um, it's not ever been sequenced from South America. So we don't know how close, how closely related ours are to the originals at all. So we know that there are a lot of different color forms that have been called Marasmus elegant and um, hematocephalus around the world. There was a lovely paper from Thailand in 2009, which suggested they had seven different forms from a white through to a purple and a pink and a a robust form and a very small form. And so I've been looking at the ones that appear to be hematocephalus here and thinking, well, maybe they're all just variant variants or forms, color forms of the same species. And so these are some of the color forms that we have around Southeast Queensland. But when I started to do the DNA, and this is very recent, um, it's, it's not more than a few weeks. And so the, when I get more specimens 
and do more iterations of the tree, it may change the relationships there. So this is what we're looking at at the moment. Everything from here down, this is the one that's said to be in the USA in Great Smoky Mountains, everything from there down has been called Marasmius hemidocephalus. And so some of these are from Thailand, Madagascar, India, Cameroons, and Malaysia. And yet the Queensland and Australian ones fit into all these different groups. And the groups are different enough that they are probably, possibly separate species. So let's have a look at what they actually look like. So this, these first two are from northern New South Wales, and they have a wine red cap and, and this very pink. And they're small and they're fairly sparse. The next group, I was getting three of them, this one and this one and this one, and I thought, well, maybe these are the lavendery sort of ones. And then I got this one back, which I call cinnamon bells, and it fits right in the book. Oh, sorry, it fits, nope, it's not where to go, right in the middle of that same group. So colour obviously is not the defining character. These ones are somewhat smaller than these ones here, are somewhat larger than many of the others. They have this distinct bell like form at times, not always, but at times. Are there other features microscopically that can separate them? I'm not sure yet. We'll get onto that, hopefully. Then the next one down, these ones have all been found on our property. And you can see even there, there's a lot of color variation. Then this one, which fits in with some of the Thai specimens, is that one. And then these other two, which are, oh, there's only one there, um, these two here are from Cairns and far north Queensland, and they fit in with Thailand and India. And that's the one of the Thai specimens that's there. So again, there's a lot of variation in colour, and colour doesn't seem to be the way to tell them apart, but maybe form possibly size and the actual shape. So we've got all those. And then I think, well, okay, what about all these? One could hope that this one might fit in with those rather lavender ones. I don't know. This one, I have no idea where it fits. Very small and opens out almost flat. This one, I've tried to do the DNA but failed. And so, I don't know, but it means that there's a lot more needs to be collected. And so I've been up and down many rabbit holes and begin to think how many can one go down in any one PhD? I think there's a lot that you can get go down and have to come out of again. And then I say, well, can I get some help working out some of these rabbit warrants, please? Yes. And this is what I need. I would really like some specimens of the Aftracotus from Southeast Queensland, for example, from Brisbane suburban lawns, if at all possible. And I would like to get specimens of all the Marasmus elegans and its lookalikes in Southeast Queensland. We found one on Mount Cordo last year, and um, it has beautiful decorative uh, cells on the stem. Unfortunately, we couldn't get the DNA. I haven't been able to get the DNA to work from it, but we need more of all those different ones. And I really would love more specimens of hemidocephalus and all its color variations and different forms. The only specimens of Crinosequi that I need are ones that have got multiple fruit bodies. Like if they've got 20 fruit bodies, that's great. The herbarium needs some more supplied. But otherwise, um, really, I think we have enough from Southeast Queensland 
because um, there's only just the one species, I think, in Southeast Queensland. So it's a work in progress and um, watch this space and you may be able to add to it. Uh, so any questions now? I had a quick question, Fran. I'm just curious because a lot of mycophages would probably be more familiar with Merasmus oreades, yes. which is the edible specimen. Have you done any work on Merasmus oreades or do you know, know anything about it? I know only that it is probably introduced to Australia, probably is not native to Australia, it's from Europe. And it was first recorded uh, somewhere around the Sydney region, and it's likely that it was introduced to that area. Um, and I've seen it in Melbourne, collected it once or twice there. Uh, it's probably not on, high on my priority list simply because it's already been well worked over from overseas. That's inedible. Um, there is a question from Vanessa Ryan. And she's asking, how many fruiting bodies do you need for a good collection? Well, that depends on which one. For, for the Crinosec, we I'd love to have some like Tammy saw at Mount Byron with about 20 fruit bodies on it. No, um, and that occasion, only occasionally happens when there's been really good rain and uh, it's just in perfect conditions and then you can get that. But for some of the ones like the elegans and its lookalikes, you may only find a couple of fruit bodies, but they're a little bit bigger than the tiny ones. And so that's adequate. And for that, Aftracoda, sometimes it's one's, one's um, fruit body only. Uh, but you, you would love to have, for say, Hematocephalus, you'd love to have at least 10 or 15 fruit bodies, 20 if you can. But, um, yeah. Thanks, Fred. Can you speak at all on the color variations? And do you have any ideas of why they would be exactly the same species yet visually? Different? I think that colour is a very, um, it, it's a very, what's the word? It, it can vary tremendously. We know that in some species, like <clears throat> there's one that we described called Merasmus vagus, and it is normally sort of an orangey coloured cap, but in dry weather, it's a deep orange. And in wet weather, if there's been a lot of rain, it's almost white it seems that the colour just washes out. So that's one reason why there may be quite a wide variation in colour. Um, and it's why it would be um, like that cinnamon bells that I call it and the lavendery colours and still be the same DNA wise. I just think that that's variable and, um, and it, um, I don't know yeah. the answer is. I don't really know why. Mm. Any other any other comments or any other questions? I have a comment here, Fran, from Dona saying congratulations, Fran, on a wonderful, engaging and interesting presentation with stunning photos. So thank you. Oh, thanks. Thank you, Diana. And how many more years do you think you've got before you um, have unraveled the Marasmius mysteries? <laughs> Decades? How long has yeah. it? Well, yeah, well, I guess how long do you think you've still got to go in oh. studying Marasmius? Oh, well, it's interesting because this is changing week by week. Mm. And um, I've probably come to a bit of a, a stopping point shortly because I'll have run out of specimens. I'm working through all the herbarium specimens and a whole bunch that have come over from New Zealand that I got today. And uh, there's more coming up from Melbourne at the moment. And uh, so by the time I've gone through all those, I'll probably be, sorry, I'll probably be pretty much through what I can do at present, but I would like to have more specimens to work on. And that hopefully might happen within the next collecting season. It would be lovely to have um, a whole bunch of stuff come in in the next collecting season from other people and from myself. Um, we see them on Facebook. 
and people sort of take photos of these really beautiful things. And then I go, oh, I really would love a collection of that. And if you don't collect it on the day, it's gone. And I think I'm a bit guilty because I thought the pink ones were very common and probably you had heaps of those ones. No. But by the sounds of it, you don't have anywhere near enough. So it's, it's interesting that you see so many pictures of it and you think it's so common that maybe collections aren't required, but mm. obviously that's mm. not the case. And I think it's a really good idea for any fungus at all that you think you've got, you know what it is, and you think, oh, is this common? Do I really, should I really collect it? Go to the ALA and anybody can look up those maps and just see how many records there are. And it might surprise you to find that, oh, it's been recorded in far north Queensland and in Victoria and hasn't been recorded at my place or anywhere near my place. Mm -hmm. So that gives you a little bit of a feel when you're not sure. Vanessa Ryan has a question. She's asking, are these species found in South America? Yeah, that's a really good question, Vanessa. Um, there are a lot of marasmias in South America, but they have different ones. Now, they have the, the true hematocephalus, apparently, and ours may not, in fact, any of them be hematocephalus. We need to get, and we're in the process at the moment of writing to mycologists in South America to try and um, see if they can send us some of their sequences of true hematocephalus or bits of samples if they can't do that or whether they have um, done any work on hematocephalus, we don't know, but that's where the original one was described, so that's where the name belongs, and so what we have may end up being something different altogether, and so that'll be interesting. They have, similarly, they have horsehair fungi, but I'm not sure that they have Prinosequi, which, remember, is an Australian-described species. So all these ones overseas may end up having to have different names put to them. That will be fun. <laughs> and uh, Elegance, of course, is an Australian-New Zealand one anyway, and I don't think it occurs anywhere else in the world. And Trichotis, well, ours is a, is a southerly one and is clearly different from the true trichotis and the neotrichotis and the paratrichotis that have been described elsewhere. So I'm going to call that one australotrichotis, meaning southerly species. And um, so that's, yeah, that's a new one. Yeah, one more. For the um, Rasmus quinazequi, yeah. is that, does, do the fruiting bodies continually, continuously come off that hyphal structure? Does that hyphal structure stay in place and it just keeps fruiting again and again off the same structure? I think it has a lifespan. I collected some because you can get the DNA from the rhizomorphs yeah. themselves uh, when they're living. Um, and I think that it may only last until it's used up all the nutrients from the dead leaves that have fallen into the little trap. It's a litter trap. Yeah. And once the dead leaves have, fallen, have, have been digested, then I think it may actually eventually die. The, the rhizomorphs may die and then it wouldn't produce any more fruit bodies. Yeah. I tried to do DNA off a couple of specimens that I collected at Binnaburra last year, earlier this year, and nothing. I got nothing at all. And I think that they've probably been spent. You know, they were done. So, yeah. And doubling on that, how the heck does it get it that high? <laughs> Well, we think that birds are often the means of transporting bits of the um, rhizomorph and then it starts to grow again and attaches to leaves and catches its nutrients yeah. as they fall. The interesting thing is that most decomposers of leaf litter are on the floor of the forest and there's fierce competition down there between multiple different species. This thing's very clever because it catches its leaves up there where there isn't nearly as much competition mm. and it might be the only species there and it's getting its nutrients in the air. And these threads that have got melanin on them are water resistant and, they, and yet they can still absorb their nutrients so they can survive uh, in, still it's in rainforest usually, it's not in, out in the open. So, 
Are there any more questions? Good. Great. Thanks. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you. Thank you.